ended when she was two, and the French Revolution when she was 19. Napoleon crowned himself Emperor of France when she was 25, and 11 years later came Waterloo. She would have read dispatches in the press about the Crimean War, and in the following year about the horrors of the Indian Mutiny. A long-time opponent of slavery, she saw the passing of the Slavery Act in 1833 and the American Civil War of 1861 to 65. Her life also saw immense developments in all the sciences, from anaesthetics to the theory of evolution, from Faraday's experiments in electricity to the first calculating machine, in chemistry the discovery of dozens of new elements, from Montgolfier's fire balloon to the penny farthing bicycle. She was a firm supporter of the rights of women, especially their right to be properly educated. Although she did not live to see the Oxford College that was named after her seven years after her death in 1879. A child of her class, comfortable but not wealthy, well-connected, professional, Edinburgh. Mary's mother was Margaret Charters, daughter of Samuel Charters, who was Solicitor General for Customs for Scotland. At the time of her marriage, Mary's father, William George Fairfax, was a lieutenant in the Royal Navy. The Fairfax family was originally from Yorkshire and was connected to Sir Thomas Fairfax, who was commander of Cromwell's New Model Army. The family also had a very loose connection to General George Washington, whose mother was a Fairfax. And indeed, during the War of Independence, um, Washington wrote to Mary's father, who was on a, a British man of war patrolling the east coast of America, suggesting that he came to pay a visit and saying that he really didn't see why war should interfere with the courtesies of private life. Mary doesn't say whether her father actually accepted, but I can't believe she wouldn't have told us if he had. It was probably a bit difficult to get off a military man of war. Um, as was common in the 1750s, her father William had been sent to sea at the age of 10 as a midshipman. So he had very little formal education, although he read widely. As a youth, he was with General Wolfe, at the capture of Quebec in 1759. He was to serve 67 years in the Royal Navy, rising to become Vice Admiral of the Red. So Mary and her circle would have been very familiar with international affairs. Mary's grandfather, Samuel Charters, lived in Edinburgh, but he had a house and gardens at Burnt Island on the north side of the Forth in Fife. Shipbuilding was an important industry there, and her mother Margaret met William at Burnt Island when the vessel he was commanding was disabled in a gale and he put in there for repairs. They married in 1772. Six years later, in August 1778, William was captured, his ship was captured by the French in the Channel, and he spent 18 years a prisoner on parole in France that is, he was completely free on the promise that he would not try to escape. Um, he was released in 1780 as part of a prisoner exchange. And needless to say, Margaret became pregnant almost immediately. But I had a bit of a mystery here, because nearly all the sources I was looking at said that William was two years a prisoner in France. Now, if he was captured in August 1778, and released in August 1780, and Mary was born in, on Boxing Day 1780, was there a bit of a scandal. <laughs> Fortunately, eventually, I found one source that said that William was released in the early spring of 1780. So, phew! <laughs> <laughs> that winter, and heavily pregnant, with her fifth child, three had died in pregnant, in, um, infancy, so the only surviving child before Mary was her son, Sam, Margaret accompanied William to London, where he was to embark for a long period of service off the American coast. The American War of Independence wouldn't end for another three years. Margaret just made it back 
to the mouse in Jedburgh before giving birth to Mary on Boxing Day, 1780. Margaret's older sister Martha was the wife of Dr. Thomas Somerville, minister at Jedburgh Parish Church. After the birth, Margaret became seriously ill. Fortunately, her sister Martha had not yet weaned her own baby and was able to breastfeed her new nurse until a wet nurse could be um, obtained. Margaret was to have two more children, Margaret and Henry. While her husband was at sea, Margaret and the children lived at Burnt Island. Mary's recollection of her childhood was of running wild in the summer with her brother Sam, who was three years older and who the rest of the year lived with their grandfather in Edinburgh attending uh, the high school. This gave uh, Mary a love of flowers and wildlife and she was later to make quite a serious study of botany. She seldom mentioned her younger sister Margaret, born when she was seven, and brother Henry when she was ten. Her father was an important but frequently an absent figure in her life. Unfortunately, he didn't see the need for girls to be educated beyond being able to read the Bible and to cast up uh, household accounts. As was common at the time, Mary, as a mere girl, was only taught by her mother to read, not to bother writing, and at 10 she was sent to board at Miss Primrose's school in Musselboro, returning to Burnt Island, still unable to write properly, and her mother bemoaned the waste of money. Deportment, however, was a very important subject at the school, and Mary recollected I was enclosed in steel stays, with a steel busk in front, while above my frock bands drew my shoulders back till the shoulder blades met. Then a steel rod with a semicircle which went under the chin was clasped to the steel busk in my stays. In this I had to prepare my lessons. When Mary was 13, her mother took a small apartment in Edinburgh so that Mary could attend a writing school in Edinburgh where she also studied arithmetic. Her great joy was the piano given to her by her uncle, William Henry Chalmers, and she was given lessons. Girls could certainly be allowed to play the piano. Being Mary, she played for four or five hours daily. And of course, as one does as a girl at the age of 13, she taught herself Latin. She went to stay with her aunt in Jedburgh for several months. Whose, whose husband, Dr. Thomas Somerville, approved of her thirst for knowledge, helped her very much with her Latin, they regularly read it together, and he was the only man in her family to give her any help whatsoever. But he encouraged her in learning Latin, saying to her that in ancient times, women had been elegant scholars. While in Edinburgh, the young ladies were given a reasonable amount of liberty. They were allowed to meet their bows on promenades along Princess Street and could give small supper parties at which the young men were introduced to the parents. Unlike many in their circle, Mary's mother could not afford a, a butler or footman to accompany her, but she expressed complete um, trust in the sedan chair men of Edinburgh, who, according to her, were all Highlanders. <laughs> One accomplishment that all young ladies of the time had to acquire was, of course, to learn to dance. Minuets, reels and country dances. The waltz was becoming popular in France, but it was still considered shocking in London and certainly hadn't reached polite society in Edinburgh. <laughs> in Edinburgh, she was sent to Strangers Dancing School and she has left a lively description in her recollections. I couldn't find a picture of Strange himself, but this isn't quite like it. Strange himself was exactly like a figure on the stage, tall and thin. He wore a powdered wig with cannons at his ears. I presume those are those horizontal rolls on mm. wigs. And a pigtail. Ruffles at breast and wrists, white waistcoat, black silk or velvet shorts, white silk stockings, large silver buckles, and a pale blue coat completed his costume. He had a little fiddle on which he played called a kit. My first lesson was how to walk and make a curtsy. Young lady, 
If you visit the Queen, you must make three curtsies, lower, lower, and lower, as you approach her. Now, if the Queen were to ask you to eat a bit of mutton with her, what would you say? The young ladies and their and boys practiced every Saturday afternoon in the assembly rooms in George Street. They wore full evening dress, and the young officers from the castle and other young men used to come and watch. Mary made her own day dresses of white cambric or printed cotton, and her evening dresses of India muslin over rose satin, with a fall of broad and very fine lace around the bosom. She recollected, and I just love this, she recollected, I usually had my hair plain, but feathers were very much in fashion. And I cannot help laughing to think that I sometimes appeared with three high ostrich feathers above my forehead, either in white or with a scarlet one in the middle. Um, these ostrich feathers were at least 18 inches high, you know, probably near two feet. What I love is a sort of Chinese hat attached to the, at the back chair now. This is needless to say, Gilray, who is priceless. So, what did the young teenage Mary look like? Friends reported that she had a graceful figure, below middle size, so she was probably only, well, five foot or something, a small head well set on her shoulders, a beautiful complexion, bright intelligent eyes, and a profusion of soft brown hair. I have said that the family would have been well informed about international affairs, especially anything affecting the British Navy. When Mary was 17, her father William was flag captain of HMS Venerable under the Scot Admiral Duncan. This portrait of Duncan is in Paxton House. Um, in those days, conditions and discipline in the services were dreadful. It was the era of bad food, scurvy, floggings, press gangs. And in 1797, the British fleet uh, had been cruising off Camperdown, keeping an eye on a Dutch fleet which was still in port. The British sailors mutinied, took over their ships, and returned to England, leaving only the um, HMS Venerable and a frigate. To deceive the Dutch, the two ships continued to signal to each other as though the rest of the fleet was in the offing, until they too could return to England, when William and the Admiral went on board every ship, ordered the men to arrest the ringleaders, and immediately returned to their station off the Dutch coast. And on the 11th of October, 1797, the Dutch fleet finally left port, formed a line of battle, broadside on to the British ship so that the guns could bear. William suggested to Admiral Duncan that they break through the line and attack the Dutch from the rear. And this they did, capturing nine Dutch ships of the line and two frigates. And William was sent home to announce the victory to the Admiralty. Mary was to comment that her father was cool and resourceful in danger. William was knighted, however, he did not ask for, and so was not given, the usual reward of a special pension. <coughs> Although he was promoted to Rear Admiral and finally would become Admiral of the Red in 1810. On his death three years later, his widow was left very badly off on just £75 a year. His son Henry was eventually made a baronet in recognition of his father's service at Camperdown. Mary regularly visited her aunt in Jedra, where she took advantage of her cousin's friendship with David Brewster, son of the Jedra schoolmaster. Much the same age as she, he was educated to follow his father into the ministry. But in 1799, he became absorbed by the science of optics, especially the properties of polarised light. He went on to be elected to the Royal Academy in 1815, and the following year he invented the kaleidoscope. He improved the stereoscope and persuaded the British to adopt the Fresnel lens for use in lighthouses. Mary was to become fascinated by his experiments, his work in optics, and he was to remain a close, lifelong colleague and friend. These winters in Edinburgh, 
with Uncle William Charters brought other friendships, such as Charles Lyle, who was younger than Mary. Charles would go on to write The Principles of Geology, which built on Hutton's new and revolutionary ideas about how the earth was formed. Now, Hutton did work in Jedburgh and also St. Dad's Head and that, that sort of area, looking at the geology. It wasn't just how the earth was formed, but of its age. In other words, that the earth is billions of years old, not just the 4,000 as extrapolated from the Bible. It was a runaway bestseller. In the book, Lyle could explain earthquakes and coin names such as Paleozoic and Mesozoic for the ages of the earth. He became a close friend of Mary's, fostering in her a long, lifelong um, interest in geology. And in 1848, she was to write and publish her book, Physical Geography. Mary had a strong faith, but she was not interested in the myths and shibboleths for instance, uh, like the, the Ark and, and that sort of thing. But her espousal of Hutton's theory brought public condemnation from the pulpit of York Minster, of all places. Returning to Burnt Island, after a winter in Edinburgh, Mary made her first encounter with algebra, weirdly in an illustrated magazine of women's fashions, and you see, irritating me, she doesn't say what, what, what they said or why on earth it was in there. In any case, she couldn't make anything very much out of it. Not one of her relations or acquaintances had, at that time had any knowledge of mathematics, science or natural history. Although her father must have known a great deal about the science of navigation, but he wouldn't have spoken to her about it and she wouldn't have known how to ask. But she was also up against the prejudice by men that the life of the mind might produce madness, aggression, or frumpiness in women. So she was wary of, di of displaying too much intellectual curiosity. Learning to draw was a suitable female accomplishment. And through a friend who painted miniatures, Mary went to classes, and this enabled her to get elementary books on geometry and algebra without any questions being asked. Otherwise, the summer at Burnt Island was spent playing the piano on household duties, and, as one does, teaching oneself Greek. She went on to learn French, German, and Italian, and she was proficient in them all, but because it was all from books, she was always diffident about speaking them although she was to make sure that her own daughters could speak fluently by employing Italian, German, and French maids. The minister of Burnt Island was actually the father of William's first wife, who had died two years before he married Margaret. He was a strict Calvinist, and she has left a detailed description of the annual communion service, which was attended by ministers from all around, who had to be accommodated, of course, by people in the town. It lasted five days of long services, and so many people attended the services that if the weather permitted, they were held out of doors. And on the Sunday, so many came to take the sacrament that it went on late until the evening, despite being served by all the visiting ministers. Unsurprisingly, she found a burnt island Sabbath very very tedious. <laughs> Her own parents were much more liberal, and she did not have the Calvinist prejudices against the theatre. So she saw Shakespeare and other plays in Edinburgh, and also Mrs. Siddons and joined John Kemble when they came north. In Edinburgh, she was also able to attend an academy opened by the landscape painter Alexander Naismith where she overheard him telling one of the other pupils, you should study Euclid's elements of geometry, the foundation not only of perspective, but of astronomy and all mechanical science. At last, Mary had her guide. But as a mere girl without any money of her own, she could not herself go into a bookseller in Edinburgh and ask for it. So that door, having been opened a crack, was slammed shut. However, 
Help was at hand back in Burnt Island because a Mr. Craw came to live in the house as tutor to her younger brother, Henry. He had little knowledge of geometry and algebra, but the next time he was in Edinburgh, he good-naturedly brought her Euclid in English and also Bonnie Castle's Algebra, both books being used in boys' grammar schools. So she got up at dawn to study Algebra or the classics before her household duties, read at night until the servants complained that her candles were soon exhausted. They were then ordered to take away her candles as soon as she was in bed because study was bad for girls. By then, fortunately, she had managed to get through the first six books of Euclid's 13 books, and so as she lay there in the dark, she was able to go through them in her mind. Those of you who know Louisa May Alcott's Little Women books know that this was still the norm a hundred years later, that any thirst for knowledge led to madness, especially in women. She was never a pre, taking, as you have already heard, a lively interest in fashion, theatre, social life, and relaxing, as many of her fellow friends did, with the Gothic bestsellers of the time, such as Anne Radcliffe's The Mysteries of Udolpho, which was later sent up by Jane Austen in her book, Northanger Abbey. In 1804, when Mary was 23, she married Samuel Gregg, son of Admiral Sir Samuel Gregg and a distant relation on the charter side of the family. Her father-in-law, Admiral Gregg, had transferred from the Royal Navy into the Imperial Russian Navy. One son, Sir Alexis Gregg, commanded the Russian fleet in the Black Sea for 20 years. Mary's husband, Sam, was commissioner for the Russian Navy when he arrived in the Firth of Forth on a Russian frigate to be given hospitality by the family at Burnt Island. To enable the young couple to marry, Sam was appointed Russian consul in London and Mary moved into his house there. The marriage was not a success. Mary herself was to write that he had a very low opinion. Oops. Sorry, I will need to put a light on. Um, a very low opinion, well at least I can put that lot out um, of uh, I've lost it. Of the capacity of my sex and had neither knowledge of nor interest in science of any kind. After Mary's death, her great friend Frances Power Cobb founder of the animal rights movement and a supporter of women's suffrage and social reform, actually reviewed her book, Recollections, for the Royal Academy, and she claimed that Greg was, to the last degree, harsh, stern and unsympathising. But then she adored Mary, so I don't think she would, however he was, she would never have cared for him. Frances was later to donate a bust of Mary by Lawrence MacDonald to Vassar University in America. After three years, Samuel died in 1807, leaving Mary a widow with two infant sons. Vorontsov, who was named after the Russian ambassador who was his godfather, and William George. And Mary returned to that island, but now as a widow with her own means, she had her independence. She had also developed a circle of science friends during her period in London, which she enlarged in Edinburgh. And she was in regular touch with men such as John Playfair and, and William Wallace. John Playfair, Professor of Natural History at Edinburgh, is perhaps best known for his book, and I don't expect any of you know it, except possibly Keith, Illustrations of the Hartonian Theory of the Earth, which was widely read when it was published. And he also wrote a textbook on geometry. William Wallace was one of his pupils and became Professor of Mathematics at the Royal Military College where he was a regular visit to the Greggs when they were in London. And he later became Professor of Mathematics in Edinburgh. Mary regularly discussed with him mathematical problems set out in academic papers. And indeed, in 1811, Mary was actually to receive a silver medal for her elegant solution to one of these problems. 
She also read Newton's Principia in Latin and Laplace's Mécanique Céleste in French and many other mathematical and astronomical texts. In 1812, Mary married another cousin, well, there's the two years I've just been talking about, sorry, um, William Somerville, son of her mother's sister, Martha, and the Reverend Thomas Somerville, in whose house in Jebra she had been born. Mary used to enjoy telling people that she had been suckled by her aunt and mother-in-law without pointing out it was one and the same person. <laughs> William was very different to Samuel Gray. Until his marriage, he had lived most of his life overseas. He had entered the army as a surgeon and served in the Cape Colony, witnessing the taking of the Cape of Good Hope and was sent to make treaty with the tribes who had attacked the Boers. While he was in the Eastern Cape, he was part of two expeditions in the second of which he made a study of Hottentot women and reached the Orange River. At one point he was condemned to death by a Catholic chief and only saved by the intercessions of the chief's mother. He seems to be rather a charmer. He later served in Canada and Sicily before coming home to graduate as a doctor of medicine from Aberdeen University. At that time there was still a huge gulf between being a surgeon, which was a trade, and being a proper physician, which was a profession. In 1800, he was appointed head of the Army Medical Department in, Med uh, in Scotland, settling in Edinburgh. In her recollections, Mary never mentions that he actually had an acknowledged natural son, James Craig Somerville, whom he brought over from South Africa, educated, and who graduated as a doctor from Edinburgh University, and was part of their family circle. William's knowledge of the world beyond Scotland was particularly important to Mary. She was aware that being in Scotland was stifling her intellectual life, and regarded her departure from it as a fortunate escape. <coughs> in 1837, she would write to her daughters, Jennifer of my birthplace I saw without pleasure, she was in newborn babe, and left without regret. Yet the veil is most beautiful. But a place, however lovely, is only agreeable in solitude or good society, neither of which charm does it possess. And then she goes on to say to her daughters, if you marry Scotchmen, take care that they are good ones. The Scotch are like foreigners in one respect, the very high alone are tolerable, and they not always. <laughs> it was written in some bitterness, of the criticism of her second marriage from some of her Scots relations and acquaintances and also from the family of Vorontsov's bride. Although they were ed educated and active women, neither of her daughters married and both lived with her for the rest of her life. However, their letters show spirited responses to the procession of the great of their mother's acquaintances through their lives. In Italy, they sailed their own boat, they rode alone on the Roman Campagna, they played musical instruments, sang, painted, they just seemed to have liked their mother's company. Um, one thing about Jebra, we're almost certain that she went to visit uh, James Veach, the, uh, the Jebra plowman who was a maker of telescopes and actually became a very fine amateur astronomer. William Somerville was an excellent classical scholar, interested in natural history, botany, mineralogy of the countries he, was, he had been through. But most importantly, William was extremely and completely supportive of Mary's need to study. One of his pleasures was in helping Mary by visiting libraries, copying and recopying manuscripts. No um, typewriters, let alone computers in those days. And he was an excellent proofreader of her work. When they first married and they lived in Edinburgh, they followed William Wallace's advice to read the most advanced French texts of the day. The French were particularly advanced in mathematics and astronomy, as well as studying botany and improving her knowledge of Greek. In 1816, William was appointed an inspector of the Army Medical Board, and the family moved to central London. She and her husband also studied the new science of geology,
building up a very Victorian collection of minerals. Very hospitable, they had many scientists in their close circle of friends. Mary was elected to the Royal Society and they moved in the leading scientific circles of their day. Close friends included the mathematician George Airy, <coughs> who was to become an astronomer royal, John Herschel, the English polymath, mathematician, astronomer, chemist, inventor, experimental photographer and botanist, William Herschel, father of John, who was a musician and astronomer and builder of telescopes, with one of which he discovered the planet Uranus in 1781. George Peacock, the Cambridge mathematician who worked with Charles Babbage to bring Cambridge out of the Dark Ages and use the modern differential calculus. Together they formed the Analytical Society. Mary made frequent visits to Babbage while he was making his calculating machine, discussing his progress and problems. Another friend of Mary's in London was Lord Byron's estranged wife, and Mary taught their daughter, Ada Lovelace, who herself was a considerable mathematician. Ada Lovelace, who worked with Charles Babbage, is considered to have written the very first instructions for the very first computer program. Mary had women friends as well, Joanna Bailey, the um, poet and romantic playwright, Joanna's brothers were the famous Glaswegian surgeons and anatomists, William and John Hunter, from whom the Hunterian Museum in Glasgow is named. Another long-time friend was Maria Edgeworth, the Anglo-Irish writer, who was the first realistic writer in children's fiction and a significant figure in the evolution of the novel. And it wasn't just British scientists who formed part of their circles, Mary and William, met leading European scientists and mathematicians when they visited London. Men such as Jean-Baptiste Biot, I don't know whether he's Biot or Biot, now you know, I know you don't normally pronounce the T, but you do sometimes. Um, professor of, math of physics, a mathematician <coughs> who worked in electricity, elasticity, heat, optics, geometry, and Francois Arago, again a mathematician, physicist and astronomer. In 1817, just two years after Waterloo, Mary and William visited Paris. It was largely thanks to Sir Thomas Brisbane of McCurston, uh, near Kelso, that the Paris Observatory had been saved from looting and destruction the year before. In Paris, Mary and William met, moved in the highest scientific circles, meeting the leading French scientists of the day. When they returned from Paris, William was appointed a physician at the Royal Hospital, and they moved out of London to Chelsea, out of the country. <laughs> Over the next two decades, the Somervilles played a significant part in the intellectual life of London, not just in the sciences, but also in the arts and physics and politics. William's work at the Chelsea Hospital seems to have been a little more than a sinecure um, enabling him to move with ease to some of the highest intellectual um, society of Europe, while always admitting the superior abilities of his wife. They were also on intimate terms with, sorry, I've gone, let me go back one, um, with literary society, the historian Henry Hallam, the Irish poet Thomas More, the economist Thomas Malthus, the wit of Sidney Smith and Dr. Henry Holland, the brilliant and beautiful granddaughters of Brinsley Sheridan, who were known as the Three Graces, and especially the famous dinner parties given by the publisher John Murray II in Albemarle Street, as well as the dinners given by Miss Lydia White to as many celebrities of the day as she could collect in her home. William had long been a friend of Sir Walter Scott, and there were many intimate supper parties at Abbotsford when they were up in Scotland. The period 1815 to 1840 saw amazing progress in British science and engineering, and this roughly coincided with the time that William and Mary were in London. Davy invented a safety lamp in 1815. 1818 saw the first iron passenger ship on the Clyde. 1820, Ampere propounded his electromagnetic theory 1825, Stevenson's rocket made its first run. 1831, chloroform was discovered. Faraday published his work on electromagnetic induction. And 
1834 propounded his laws of electrolysis. 1835, Darwin reached the Galapagos Islands. 1838, Daguerre made photographs using silver salts. 1839, Fox Talbot invented photographic paper. And in 1840, Draper made the first photograph of the moon. Death was always just round the corner. Mary was particularly affected by the too early death in India of her oldest brother, Sam, at the age of 21. He had been her childhood companion at Burnt Island and in Edinburgh. Her father died in 1813, although her mother was to live on to the age of 90. All parents in those days had to suffer the death of one or more of their children, and Mary was no exception. Her younger son by Greg, William George Greg, died when he was only nine. And his brother, Voronsol Greg, still predeceased Mary, although he was 60. Mary's first baby by William Somerville, a boy, died in infancy. But the great sadness in her life was the death of her eldest daughter, Margaret, aged 10 in 1823. Mary described her as a child of intelligence and acquirements far beyond her tender age. But she really felt the loss because she did feel that perhaps she had pushed the child too much. She had strained her in some way. In 1826, at the age of 45, Mary published her first scientific paper, The Magnetic Properties of the Violet Rays of the Solar System, in the Proceedings of the Royal Society. The paper attracted much interest, although the theory she propounded was later disproved and Mary had all copies destroyed. But as a consequence, a year later, Lord Broome, oh, sorry, where am I going? Perhaps that. We should be going on to Lord Broome. Yes, there he is. Um, made a request on behalf of the Society for the Diffusion of Useful Knowledge that Mary should translate Laplace's Mécanique Sylvestre from the French. Laplace wrote his book without illustrations and assuming considerable mathematical knowledge in his readers. So Mary didn't just translate his text, she explained it. In particular, Laplace presumed that most of his readers would be familiar with the advanced differential calculus he was using, which was common in France, but not in England, because out of reverence for Isaac Newton, this was not being used by most mathematicians in England. Now, I have never used calculus, but I did look it up in the dictionary, and this is what it said, noun. A branch of mathematics concerned with the determination, properties, and application of derivations and differentials, i.e. the rates at which quantities change. So, now you know. <laughs> um, I think we have one mathematician in the audience, so perhaps afterwards he can explain it better. Um, <coughs> as she said, Mary, therefore, had to translate analytical formulae into intelligent language and to draw diagrams illustrative of that. So when completed, her version of the mechanism of the heavens was far too large to be published by the society. And uh, John Herschel recommended its publication by John Murray. Murray was taking a bit of a gamble, um, but published in 1831, when Mary was 50, to considerable praise, it was an immediate success. She was urged to follow it up by writing a volume on the form and rotation of the Earth and planets. She wrote, My work was extensive, for it comprised the analytical attraction of spheroids, the form and rotation of the Earth, the tides of the ocean and atmosphere, and small undulations. And no, I haven't the faintest idea what she's on about. <laughs> While it's true, truly hard, for Mary to become proficient in mathematics through private study. Yeah, missed one. I've missed one, yes, yes that's right. Um, sorry, I think I keep on catching the edge of the thing, so it's not clicking to that. 
When she had shown her aptitude, there were plenty of men who were willing to help, especially once she had obtained her independence as a woman, and even more especially once she had got a supportive second husband. In this way, she was very like the clever men from unprivileged backgrounds. The mathematician William Wallace, whom I've already mentioned, and Michael Faraday were both bookbinders' apprentices when they were discovered and helped by wealthier men. Prejudices about men and women still existed, of course. Um, women like Mary's great friend, Caroline Herschel, sister of William and aunt to John, were accepted as clever, intellectual helpmeets to the men. But Mary stood alone and felt that she had to show she was exemplary as a woman, as well as a, as a mathematician and scientist. So what was a 50-year-old Mary like? In 1831, James uh, David Forbes, who would later become the principal of St. Andrew's University, wrote in his notebook, that's right. Below middle size, fair countenance, not particularly expressive except eyes which are piercing, short-sighted, manners the simplest possible, her conversation very simple and pleasing, simplicity not showing in abstaining from scientific subjects with which she is so well acquainted, but in being ready to talk on them with all the naivety of a child and the utmost unconsciousness of the rarity of such knowledge as she possesses so that it requires a moment's reflection to be aware that one is hearing something very extraordinary. And then, of course, he spoils it all by saying, from the mouth of a woman. <laughs> her mother died at the age of 90 when Mary was in Paris working on her book, The Connection of the Physical Sciences, published in 1834. In the sixth edition, published in 1842, she described discussed the presence of a hypothetical planet perturbing the planet of Uranus. This led John Cooch Adams to investigate and to his subsequent discovery of the planet Neptune. So in the eighth edition of the connection, Mary was able to write, this prediction has been fulfilled. Honours now came quickly. She was elected to the Royal Irish Academy uh, in 1834 and to the Royal Astronomical Society in 1835, at the same time as Caroline Herschel, and to the Société de Physique et d'Histoire Naturelle in Geneva. She was later to be elected to the American Geographical and Statistical Society in 1857. Sir Robert Peel gave her a civil pension of £200 per annum during his first period in office, and this was increased to 300 by Viscount Melbourne when he became Prime Minister. In 1838, William was taken seriously ill and they promptly moved from Chelsea, which he'd never liked, back into the better air of, Ch of London. And as soon as he was well enough, he gave up his appointment and they uprooted to Rome. William was to survive, in fact, another 22 years during this time, Mary continued to write a number of books, the most important being her Physical Geography, published in 1848. Her day was to work every morning till two o'clock and then go to some gallery or for a walk, dining at six in the evening, or either went out or received visits at home, which she describes as the pleasantest way of seeing friends, as it does not interfere with one's occupations. She was received by the Pope. On visits to London, she was given complete use of the library and papers at the East India Company's India House. She mentions visiting Turner in his studios, and indeed, though no, most of you wouldn't have noticed, she had a tiny cameo walk-on part in the film of Mr. Turner. In the spring, up to the villa in the hills of the Campania, where she delighted in the flowers and wildlife. Other summers of Perugia, Assisi, back to Rome, Trieste, Venice. She was never out of touch with her colleagues, such as Sir John Herschel. For instance, helping to verify all his calculations on the stars and nebulae of the Southern Hemisphere after he was appointed Astronomer Royal at the Cape. In 1844, Mary went to Kelso to visit her brother, who lived on the banks of the Tweed at Rosebank, just along the road there. 
and went on with them to Jebra. But she writes, after many years, I still thought the valley of the Jed very beautiful, but I fear the pretty stream has been invaded by manufactories. There is a perpetual war between civilization and the beauties of nature. The manse in which I was born does not exist now. Our next excursion was to a lonely village called Yetum in the hills, some seven miles from Kelso, belonging to the gypsies. The king and other men were absent, but the women were civil. The principal object was to see a stone in the wall of a small and very ancient church, on which is carved the wyvern and wheel, the crest of the Somervilles. This, in fact, was in Linton Church. Then to Edinburgh, before returning to Rome. She was to send Sir John Herschel details of some experiment she made on the effects of the solar spectrum on the juices of plants and other substances, and spent one Christmas with the Herschels in England, delighting in the friendship of Faraday, who was staying with them. In addition to writing, reading, researching, and a voluminous com correspondence with mathematicians and scientists, she, William, and their daughters were to continue their peripatetic life until on the 26th of June, 1850, William died in Florence after just three days' illness. The following year, as she had nothing to do, she embarked on writing molecular and microscopic science and spent the winter in Turin to for access to reference books. In 1865, the British squadron spent six weeks in Spezia. Her nephew, Henry Fairfax was commander on board HMS Resistance, the first ironclad to be assigned to the Mediterranean fleet. So she went all over it at the age of 85, even to the engine room and screw alley, as well as visiting several other ships in the squadron. She observed an eruption of Vesuvius over several days while staying in, in Naples, commenting on the many earthquakes worldwide and the high summer temperature in the Arctic melting the ice. <clears throat> Almost on her 90th birthday in Naples, on the afternoon of the 21st of December 1870, and after a spectacular thunderstorm overnight, the, size, the skies cleared to allow the watching of an eclipse for which many came to visit her. That year, 1870, she was elected to the Italian Geographical Society and also received the Victoria Gold Medal from the Royal Geographical Society. Darwin's Descent of Man was sent to her, which she read with great interest. Herschel's death the following year greatly distressed her. Always concerned about the treatment of animals, she headed a petition for the legal protection of animals in Italy. Throughout her life, Mary was a strong supporter of women's suffrage and women's education. She had a great admiration for John Stuart Mill, the British philosopher and economist, whose book, The Subjection of Women, was published in 1869, and she continued to press for the emancipation of women. And when Mill organized a mass petition to give women the right to vote, he had Mary put her name, her signature, first on the petition. Somerville College in Oxford was named after her in 70, 1879, because of her support for women's education. In 1872, Mary herself wrote that in her 92nd year, although extremely deaf and memory for events and names was falling, failing, she was still able to read mathematical and algebraic books for four or five hours in the morning and even still to solve problems. She was also rereading Scott. And among the last sentences in her recollections, when she was just short of her 92nd birthday and just days before her death, she wrote, I take as lively an interest as ever in passing events. I regret that I shall not live to know the result of the expedition to determine the currents of the ocean, the distance of the Earth from the Sun determined by the transit of Venus, and the source of the most renowned of rivers, the discovery of which will immortalise the name of Dr. Livingston. I have every reason to be thankful that my intellect is unimpaired. My daughters support my tottering steps and by incessant care and help make the infirmities of my age so light to me that I am perfectly happy. Now that was written just days before she died. The day before her death, she finished revising and completing her treatise 
on the theory of difference with exquisitely drawn diagrams. Mary Somerville died in her sleep on the morning of the 29th of November, 1872. Her remains rest in the English cemetery at Naples. On her tomb is a quote written by Sir David Brewster in 1829, over 40 years before her death. Certainly the most extraordinary woman in Europe, a mathematician of the very first rank, with all the gentleness of a woman. She is also a great natural philosopher and mineralogist. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Help and support to 